OK, let's compare answers. The first one is the dagger a warning or a guide? Uh, some groups took this question and they gave opposite answers. Some people think it's a warning. Other people think it's a guide. We looked at this part last week, and the basic idea is that Macbeth sees a dagger and then he notices that it's bloody and he talks about how if he does kill the king, it will be evil, it, it will involve witchcraft and it will be murder, all of these bad things. So the question here is not. Um, are these things bad? I think we all agree that these things are bad. The question is, how does Macbeth understand these images? Does he think of them as a warning to try to change his mind to make him stop trying to kill the king? Or does he think of them as a simple description of what will happen after he kills the king? So as a kind of foreshadowing, a kind of prophecy, a kind of guide to the future. So some uh, one group said they think it's a warning that maybe Macbeth could still change his mind, but at the end of this scene, he hears the bell that his wife rings to signal him to kill the king. So just like before, when he tried to get out of it and his wife convinced him to keep going, here also his internal struggle is ended by an action taken by his wife. But another group thinks that this is not a warning, it's just a guide. Uh, this group thinks that Macbeth has already decided he will kill the king. But just because you make a decision does not mean you have to accept the decision. You can do something reluctantly. And this group thinks that this is what's happening. Macbeth knows he will kill the king. He has decided and he will do it but he hates the fact that he's going to do it. And he knows that once he kills the king, his life will become all like dark and gloomy and he will forever be connected with this evil action and with the blood on his dagger. So the point here isn't what you see, but how you think about it. The question is, it looks like the question is about the dagger, but it's really asking you about Macbeth's psychology. Uh, and it's also connected to how you think about fate in this play, and we will get back to fate in question four. But first, question two. Why is the porter in the play? Uh, so let's take a look at this guy. Act two, scene three. So this is right after Macbeth kills the king, and then he hears knocking. And he says, wake Duncan with thy knocking. Uh, which in Chinese, which in, in modern English would be uh, no matter how hard you knock, you will not wake Duncan. In Chinese, something like, uh, that's what the exclamation point is. I would thou couldst. Again, in Chinese, would be. Uh, and so in the next scene, we see uh, another reaction to the knocking, knocking within. So the sound comes from behind the stage. Enter a porter. Um, so as one group very helpfully told me, a porter is somebody who answers the door. And the porter says, here is a knocking indeed. If a man were porter of Hellgate, he should have old turning the key. Knock, 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 knock. Who's there in the name of Beelzebub? Beelzebub is a devil. Here's a farmer that hanged himself on the expectation of plenty. Come in time, which means I'm coming. 
have napkins enough about you here, you'll sweat for it. Uh, so he's he's playing on the idea of dying when you're expecting a lot. So I guess this story is about a farmer who is promised that he will um, grow a lot of food and be rich. And so he spends money and eats food that he does not yet have. And therefore uh, he starves to death before he can get uh, the large amount of food or money that he's going to get. Uh, in Chinese, I guess we would call this Ying Si Mao Liang. And so because it's about food, then he has a small joke about napkins. You're going to need many napkins for all of the food you're going to eat that you don't actually have. Uh, then he hears another knock and he comes up with another situation where somebody does something bad and suffers. Then he hears a third knock, comes up with another situation, and then finally uh, he gets to the door and he opens the gate. So why is he in the play? What is his function? Uh, what, uh, two groups took this question and they both agreed that the function of the porter is as comic relief. Macbeth is a tragedy. They kill the king and then suffer for it. There's no real clown or jester or fool. Nobody telling jokes. This is the closest we get is the porter. Uh, he is also talking about the same things that Macbeth is thinking about, right? Death, hell, suffering, and uh, cosmic irony something being unexpected, being uh, played with, toyed with by the gods, being tortured by the gods. The same ideas that run throughout the whole play, but in this case, he's telling short stories that are supposed to be kind of funny or kind of amusing, not as serious as the whole story about Macbeth. So, even if you don't think it's actually funny, it does feel lighter. It's not as serious. And it's also worth noting that this scene comes right after Macbeth kills the king, which is the most serious part of the play. It's when Macbeth finally seals his fate. So just as the thing happens and we're all worried and waiting for how Macbeth will fall, we get this kind of interlude, uh, that lightens the mood. But at the same time, we know that there will be consequences for Macbeth. So even as we enjoy this short break, we are also waiting for what happens after the break. Um, so we can even say that in this scene, Shakespeare is toying with us like a like a cat playing with a mouse before it kills it. Um, so it gives it, it gives us a little bit of relief from the tension, but it also adds a different kind of tension. Uh, and then finally, as you may have noticed, this is one of the earliest examples of the knock knock joke. Where am I? Here, right? Knock knock, who's there? Right? This is a very common form of joke in English. Macbeth is one of our earliest examples. Even though, you know, it's not exactly the same and it's not as funny as an actual knock knock joke, even though actual knock knock jokes are not very funny. OK, let's take a short break. When we come back, we'll look at the next three questions.
Question three. So this is right after King Duncan's body has been discovered and everybody thinks, uh, what should we do? Let's wait till the morning. Let's take a look at this. Act two, scene three. Around 142. Okay, so here. Uh, Nick Be uh, Benquo, he says, um, against the undivulged pretense I fight of treasonous malice. So whoever turns out to have planned this, I will fight against them. And so do uh, let's let's uh, let's break this down. Undivulged to divulge means to give away some knowledge. So undivulged here means secret. Pretense today it means excuse, but here it means reason. Treason is something against your country. And malice means evil. So this sentence is I fight against the secret reasons of evil against our country. Macduff, and so do I and everybody else. So all so everybody agrees. Whoever turns out to have planned the murder, they will fight against them. And then Macbeth says, let's briefly put on manly readiness and meet in the hall together. So let's go put on our clothes and put on our armor and get ready to fight and then we'll come back. And everybody says well contented, which means good idea. Exeunt all but Malcolm and Donalbane. So everybody leaves the stage except for the two sons of Duncan. Malcolm, the older son, Donalbane, the younger son. Malcolm, what will you do? Let's not consort with them, so let's not join their discussion. Let's not join their revenge party. To show an unfelt sorrow is an office which the false man does easy. So somebody who is lying. Can easily show sorrow. That they do not feel. Office means duty. Uh, here the word office or the word duty is talking about what a false man should do in order to uh, achieve his goals. So it's easy for somebody to lie about feeling sad when they don't actually feel sad. What is this trying to say? What is the point of this sentence? Because everybody just said, oh no, the king died. We're so sad. We must take revenge. But here Malcolm says just because they say they're sad, doesn't mean that they're actually sad. So he's saying the person behind Duncan's murder is one of these people, and they're just pretending to be sad. Therefore, I'll to England. I'm going to go to England. And Donald Bain says, to Ireland I. So you go to England, I go to Ireland. Our separated fortune shall keep us both the safer. Fortune here means fate or destiny. Uh, so if we stay apart, we will be safer both. Where we are, there's daggers in men's smiles. So here, right here, when people treat us well, some of them are hiding dangerous intent. This is in Chinese. This is literally Shaori Changdao. And his conclusion, the near in blood, the nearer bloody. Uh, which means the closer in. Relation to the king we are, the more danger we are in. So like because they are the sons of the king, they are in very grave danger, whereas if they were, for example, cousins of the king, they would be in less danger. 
and Malcolm agrees. He says this murderous shaft that's shot. A shaft is an arrow. This murderous shaft that's shot hath not yet lighted. To light means to hit something. To 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 stop somewhere. Yeah, light means to stop somewhere, and if an arrow stops somewhere, that means that it has hit something. So Malcolm is saying events have not yet ended. There is still danger. And our safest way is to avoid the aim. So since the arrow is still in the air, we must try to avoid getting hit. And so they decide to leave at once. So the question is the thing in the middle, right? The near in blood, the nearer bloody. Do you think that makes sense? And um, two groups took this question. They both agree. Because they are the king's sons. They are in the most danger. Because the whoever planned the death of Duncan. Killed the king for only one reason. Because they or somebody they care about wants power. Duncan was a good king. Everybody loved him. So it's not because of justice. The only reason to kill him is for power. But when the king dies, the power goes to the king's son. And when the king's eldest son dies, the power then goes to the king's youngest son. So whoever planned Duncan's murder, if they really want to gain power, they would also have to kill Malcolm and Donalbane. Therefore, they are in the most danger. But the reason I ask this question is because what happens after they run? They run without telling anybody in the morning when everybody comes back, they discover that the two sons have gone and Macbeth says that this proves they are guilty. Let's see if we can find this. There, OK, so uh, Act 3, Scene 1, around line 31. This is page 1273. Macbeth, who is king, says to Banquo, we, we means I, right? This is the royal we. In Chinese, we would say zun. We here, our bloody cousins, are bestowed in England and in Ireland. Cousin means relative. Bestow means hidden. In England and in Ireland, not confessing their cruel parricide. Parricide means to kill the father. Right? Side means to kill. Think about words like homicide, which means murder, or insecticide, which is what you use to, to kill bugs. Peri actually comes from the Latin pater, P A T E R. Um, the Another version of this word is patricide, and that also means to kill the father. Pater means father. So they have not confessed to killing their father. Um, so these three lines imply that Malcolm and Donald Bain ran because they killed their father. So we know that they run for safety. But Macbeth is able to twist this to use this as an explanation for why he thinks they killed Duncan. So like. If you are Malcolm or Donovan, what should you do? You can't win either way. Either you stay and put yourself in danger or you run and you get blamed for the death of your father. Of course, um, anybody who thinks about it will realize that they have no reason to kill their father. Duncan's a good king. Uh, he's also getting older, so once he dies, the power will pass down to his son. So there's no reason to kill his father. The only reason nobody 
argues with Macbeth is because Macbeth is now the new king. So whatever he says, you have to just take it, even if you don't agree. Number four. Do you think it makes sense for Macbeth to finally challenge his fate? Act three, scene one. Line 72. Here, OK, so after he has talked with Banquo, uh, Banquo leaves. Everybody else leaves. His servant leaves to. Uh, get those men who are those men. We learn that the men are two murderers. And uh, later he will tell these murderers why they should want to kill Banquo. But here he's saying. Uh, he's remembering that the witches said that he would be king, but that after him the king would be Banquo's son. So he's thinking. No son of mine succeeding. Succeed means to take power after the king. Uh, Ji Wei. If it be so, so if this is true, for Banquo's issue, which means children, have I filed my mind? File means defile, which means to make dirty. For them, the gracious Duncan have I murdered. Put rancors in the vessel of my peace. Rancor is like argument and trouble. So instead of being peaceful, now my mind is filled with unquiet or disquiet. Only for them, not even my children, Banquo's children. And mine eternal jewel given to the common enemy of man to make them kings. The seeds of Banquo. Kings. OK, so the common enemy of man, this is rhetoric. Uh, he is the king, so anyone who is his enemy is everybody's enemy, basically. So he's thinking, why should I hand my power to Banquo's sons just because the witches said that would happen? Rather than so, so instead of this, come fate into the list. I welcome fate onto the battlefield and champion me to the utterance, and I will fight with fate uh, about this statement of the prophecy. And that's why he gets two people to try to kill Banquo. So the question is, does that make sense? Does it make sense for Macbeth to try to fight against the prophecy? Uh, one group took this question and they think it does make sense. Up to this point, everything that the witches have said has come true. Banquo, uh, sorry, Macbeth did become Thane of Cawdor. He did become the new king. So we know that the witches were not lying, but everything that happens comes with a cost, right? To become the new king, he had to kill Duncan, created this whole mess. So perhaps at this point, Macbeth is thinking, is it worth the cost to obey the prophecy? Is it always in my favor? And then he remembers something that he has not paid attention to ever since the beginning, which is that the witches tell him the next king will be Banquo's son, not his. Right, this information was there from the very beginning, he, but for some reason he was so ambitious, so blinded by his ambition that he was focusing on his own power and he ignored the part about Banquo. But now that he's the king, he suddenly remembers and he thinks. Uh, that's not good. I should probably try to change that. 
Um, so we know that the witch's prophecy is not 100% clear. He, they told Bank, uh, Macbeth he would become king. They didn't tell him about all of the suffering and the bad stuff that has to happen in order for him to become the king. So there's a little bit of wiggle room. There's space for him to negotiate or to interpret the prophecy in a, some specific way. And maybe that's what leads him to think that he could outright challenge the prophecy and change what the witches have foretold of the future. So it does make a kind of sense. It's not like the witches uh, showed him exactly what will happen in the future, right? There's some things that they left out, some things that Macbeth has to discover for himself. So maybe he's thinking that this fate is not entirely determined. Maybe he can change it. And question five, how would you present Banquo's ghost on stage? Act three, scene four. Page 1276. So this is where they're having dinner. Uh, and this is when Macbeth, after Macbeth has sent the two murderers to kill Banquo. And they came back and they told him that Banquo is dead. In this scene, they tell him that Banquo is dead. But then in the middle of dinner, this is the next page, enter the ghost of Banquo and sits in Macbeth's place. So this is interesting. First of all, ghost. Secondly, he sits in Macbeth's place. Presumably, they left the place for Banquo because uh, Macbeth has to pretend that Banquo will show up later. So there are two empty seats, one for Banquo and one for Macbeth because Macbeth is going around and toasting everybody and giving speeches. He's not sitting down. But the ghost of Banquo sits in Macbeth's chair. This is very strong symbolism. Macbeth is the king. Banquo will be the father of kings. It's kind of reminding us of this fact. And then later Macbeth sees that somebody is sitting in his place. But nobody else sees the ghost. And so he kind of like goes a little crazy. Uh, and then later on the ghost leaves the stage. And then the ghost comes back. Just as Macbeth is talking about Banquo, our dear friend Banquo. And then Macbeth sees the ghost again, and then he goes a little crazy, and then the ghost leaves. So the ghost doesn't actually say anything. We only see the ghost on stage. So how would you present this? One group took this question, and uh, they thought about this stage as an indoor stage. Um, we mentioned at the very beginning of the play, it says thunder and lightning. So in order to create the special effects of lightning, they have to be able to do something with the light. So it was probably an indoor stage. And remember, at the time they only had fire, they did not have electric lighting. So uh, this group thought maybe we can have. Uh, it's a dinner scene, right? And so. Uh, there will be servants moving food around, and maybe servants will also be holding torches. Hola. And so maybe the actor who plays Banquo's ghost could already be sitting in the seat, but dressed in like black. So it's hard to see him. But when the play tells us to show the ghost, maybe one servant can kind of uh, unintentionally move the light closer to Banquo. And suddenly we see that there's a person in this chair. Uh, and every time Macbeth notices him, the light moves toward Banquo. And when Banquo leaves, the light moves away from Banquo. 
it, that's one way to do this. Um, and it's a very creative way. But what if it's in an outdoor theater? In the first week, I showed you a picture of Shakespeare's Globe Theater. It's an open air. So what if you perform Macbeth outdoors? How would you show Banquo's ghosts? You can't play with lighting because it's the day. So maybe one way to do this would be again to have Banquo dressed in darker clothing than everybody else. Or if everybody is dressed in black, then you dress Banquo in white. Give him a different color. And then it's a dinner scene. Macbeth is walking around, chatting, giving speeches. The guests are all busy eating and drinking. So you can create a contrast in speed. Everybody else is moving quickly. But you can have Banquo's ghost enter and walk slowly. And when he gets to Macbeth's chair, he can sit down and not move. And that would tell the audience that this character is special. He's not just another member of the dinner party. And when Macbeth sees him and like gets shocked. Uh, then we would know that it's a ghost like or something supernatural, something scary. And of course we would know that it's Banquo because it's played by the same actor who plays Banquo. So even when you don't have a lot of technology, even when you don't have a lot of special effects, even when you don't have dialogue, Banquo's ghost doesn't say anything. You can still create the effect of something creepy and supernatural going on on stage. OK, questions about these five? OK, so for next week, please finish the play. And next week I will pass out the next handout. The fourth and final play of the semester, we're going to read The Tempest, Bao Feng Yu. Uh, and I will introduce that next week. Also, this Friday morning will be the makeup class at EE 102 from uh, in third and fourth period. 这礼拜五第三第四节在一一一零二要补课, uh, and we're going to watch the movie version of the Tempest. The movie is exactly one hundred and ten minutes long, so we have to begin as soon as the bell rings, and the movie will end as soon as the last bell rings for lunch. Um. It, we might even go maybe one minute over time, depending. I know that everybody is busy, so if you can't make it to the makeup class, that's fine. But if you can make it, I hope you will come. And and join me in watching this movie uh, again. I have not seen this movie before. But the Tempest is quite a magical play. Uh, it's often considered one of Shakespeare's fantasy plays. So I hope you will join me on Friday morning. OK, so. Uh, let's look at. Next week's. Assigned reading starting from. Act four. Act four, scene one. There we go, page 1280. A cauldron. A cauldron is where witches make their potions. What do you call that in Chinese? Anyway, that's what the cauldron is. 
Uh, traditionally, it has three legs. Sanjo. Thunder. Thunder is a sound, by the way, right? Thunder is a sound. Lightning is the light. So you hear thunder. Enter the three witches. First witch, thrice the brinded cat hath mewed. Second witch, thrice and once the hedge pig whined. Third witch, harpier cries, tis time, tis time. OK, so you don't have to really care what these lines mean. The point is that it's time. OK, so Google Translate tells me that cauldron is translated as da guo, which is a terrible translation. Um, actually, let me let me see if I can find a picture. Cauldron. That's what I'm talking about. OK, so the point is it's time. Something is going to happen. First witch, round about the cauldron go, in the poisoned entrails throw. Entrails are internal organs. Neizang. So they're brewing something. They're making something in the cauldron. Toad that under cold stone days and nights has 31 sweltered venom sleeping got. So a toad that has been sleeping under a cold rock for 31 days. Boil thou first to the charmed pot. So they throw in the toad. And then they dance around the cauldron. Double, double toil and trouble, fire burn and cauldron bubble. This is a very famous couplet from the play. Every time in modern culture you see a witch making something, they will say double, double toil and trouble, fire burn and cauldron bubble. Uh, this whole scene is they're making something uh, in their cauldron. I'm going to skip this if you don't mind. And then finally, enter Hikati to the other three witches. So Hikati, as we mentioned, is the goddess of the witches. Um, so here she enters and says, good job, let's sing a song, music and a song. And you'll notice that it doesn't tell us the song. It, it says black spirits, etc. And this is because often in Shakespeare's time, playwrights would borrow songs from other plays. So this song was probably written by somebody else, and Shakespeare was like, just go look at that play. I want you to do that song. And then after the song, Hikati exits, and the second witch says, by the pricking of my thumbs, something wicked this way comes. Again, a very famous line. Whenever you see a scene of a witch who suddenly senses that someone is coming or something is going to happen, they will probably say something wicked this way comes. Uh, this is also the source of the musical Wicked. You get in Wicked. Yes, this is uh, this is why the title of the musical is called Wicked. Open locks, whoever knocks. So the second witch opens the door by talking to the door. Enter Macbeth. This guy again. How now, which means how are you? You secret black and midnight hags. A hag is an old ugly woman. What is you do? What are you doing? And they all answer him, a deed without a name. There is no name for what we're doing. A deed is simply an action. Macbeth, I conjure you, which means I order you. Conjure also means use magic. So he's saying like, I magically order you by that which you profess. Uh, I think we talked about this use of the word by before. 
like if you swear a promise or swear an oath, you need to swear it on something at the cost of something. It's like taking out a loan, Shantaikwan, right? In order to take out a loan, you have to put up collateral, the yaping. So the point is, if you cannot repay the loan, the bank will take away your collateral. It's the same idea. If you make a promise on something and you can't fulfill your promise, then that something is not something that you actually believe in. It gets taken away. People no longer believe that you value that thing. So I conjure you by that which you profess. So the collateral for what I want you to do is your evil faith. Profess here means believe. Uh, to profess a faith is to openly believe in some kind of faith. By the way, this is the root of the word professor. Uh, a professor is somebody who shares the knowledge and the belief that he has gained from his knowledge or her knowledge. Uh, in other words, a professor, the faith of a professor is in their knowledge. So I conjure you, however you come to know it, answer me. I magically order you to give me an accurate answer by whatever you believe in. Though you untie the winds and let them fight against the churches, so you make the winds blow against the churches, though the yeasty waves confound and swallow navigation up, and you also make the ocean uh, waves large enough to prevent travel. Yeasty means with bubbles. Yeast is the thing that makes bread rise, the thing that makes beer carbonated. Xiao uh, Su, yeast, Xiao Su. So uh, it just means it gives the waves bubbles, which in this case just means the waves are big, and so when they crash, there's lots of bubble and foam. Confound means confuse and prevent, and swallow navigation up. So because of you, it's hard to travel on the ocean. Though bladed corn be lodged and trees blown down. So even if you wipe away corn and you blow down trees, Though castles topple on their warders' heads, uh, so you can make castles fall on their owners. Though palaces and pyramids do slope their heads to their foundations, so you make palaces and pyramids also fall down. Uh, though the treasure of nature's Germans tumble all together, even till destruction sicken. So even if you mix and confuse all of nature, answer me to what I ask you. So no matter what happens, you must give me an answer. Speak, demand, we'll answer. First switch. Say if thou'dst rather hear it from our mouths or from our masters. Do you want to hear us answer or do you want to hear our masters answer? Call them, let me see them. Uh, and so they all they do something to the cauldron. They add more stuff. And then they conjure their masters. Come high or low, thyself and office deftly show. So no matter how great or uh, no matter how high or low you are, come show yourself and sh and do your duty. Thunder. First apparition, so appearance, like a ghostly appearance, an armed head. So it's a head wearing armor, like a helmet. Um, so if you remember in the movie, they did something very creative. Instead of using a cauldron, they filled Macbeth's room with water and they used his whole room as a cauldron. But of course, on stage, you can't do that. You can't fill the whole stage with water. So the first dude appears. Tell me thou unknown power. 
And the first which says he knows thy thought. Hear his speech, but say thou not. Not means nothing. So shut up and listen. First apparition. Macbeth, Macbeth, Macbeth. Beware Macduff. Beware the Thane of Fife. Dismiss me enough. So that's the only thing he says, right? Beware of Macduff. And then he descends. So this tells us that when he appears, he rises. And then after he's done, he descends. So how could we do this on stage? Well, in the middle of the stage, there will be a trap door. Uh, I suddenly can't remember what you call this in Chinese. Something like that, a secret door, a trap door that will open from the ground. So what you could do is you put an empty cauldron on top of the door and you put a hole in the bottom of the cauldron. And so would the witches pretend to throw things in or they can actually throw things in uh, and it will be caught under the stage. And when you need somebody to appear, the actor can stand up through the cauldron and uh, talk to Macbeth. It's one way to do this. This line also, there are many different ways to perform this line. The way that it's written is so creepy. Right? He, repeat, he repeats Macbeth's name three times. It's like he's casting a spell. So you can do it straight like I just did, or you can make it sound creepy. Right? Macbeth. 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 Beware Macduff. Beware the Thane of Fife. Dismiss me enough. There are many possibilities for these lines. And then Macbeth's reaction, whate'er thou art, for thy good caution, thanks. So thank you for the warning. Thou hast harped my fear aright. You have guessed correctly my fear. But one word more. And the first which says, he will not be commanded. Here's another more potent than the first. Potent means powerful. Thunder, second apparition, a bloody child. OK, now we're getting some symbolism. So the first one is an armed head. Only the head. And it's wearing armor, so it's probably somebody killed on the battlefield and had their head cut off. Why would you cut off somebody's head on the battlefield when you need to take the head back to show to your king, I have killed this important person? So the armed head could be like a dead king or like a dead general. And then the second one, a bloody child. This, of course, is very evil because it means somebody killed the child. Or even worse, the child killed somebody. Again, the three Macbeths, Macbeth, Macbeth, Macbeth. Had I three ears, I'd hear thee. So no matter what, you call me three times. If I had one ear for each time you called me, I would still listen. Be bloody, bold, and resolute. Resolute means determined. Laugh to scorn the power of man. To scorn means to hold in contempt. For none of woman born shall harm Macbeth. And then he goes away. Macbeth, then live, Macduff. What need I fear of thee? Of course, later on, we realized that Macduff was not actually born of a woman. He was untimely ripped from his mother's womb. He was taken from his mother's body. He wasn't born. But yet I'll make assurance double sure. So even though you tell me I don't have to be afraid of anyone, I'm going to make sure anyway. And take a bond of fate. 
So I will make assurance to fate. Add security on top of security. Thou shalt not live. He's talking to Macduff. You will not live. That I may tell pale hearted fear it lies and sleep in spite of thunder. So if I kill you, then I can tell fear. I can talk to fear and tell it that it is lying. In other words, if it if fear tells me I should be afraid, I can show fear the body of Macduff and tell it that it is lying. And therefore I can sleep in spite of thunder. Speaking of thunder, thunder. Third apparition, a child crowned with a tree in his hand. OK, so the symbolism of this figure, a child wearing a crown. When we see this image, the first thing we think about is that Banquo's son will become king. So this image is not favorable to Macbeth because it's not Macbeth's son who becomes king, it's Banquo's. And then it's holding a tree. Of course, it's probably not an actual tree, right? Like a tree branch. Macbeth, what is this that rises like the issue of a king? Again, issue means child. And wears upon his baby brow. Brow means forehead or head. The round and top of sovereignty. So he's talking about the crown. Top means hat. And the three witches say, listen, but speak not to it. So again, shut up and listen. Third apparition. Be lion metalled, be as brave as a lion, proud, and take no care who chafes, who frets, or where conspirers are. So don't worry about anyone who is who does not want to follow you, who is making plans, or who is conspiring against you. Mimo, conspire. Macbeth shall never vanquished be. Macbeth will never die or be defeated until great Burnham Wood to high Dunsinane Hall shall come against him. Wood means forest. Dunsinane is where the king lives. So Macbeth will never be defeated until the forest comes to the king, king's castle to fight him. And then he disappears. Macbeth, that will never be. Who can impress the forest? Impress here means to press into the army, to conscript. Zhao Bing. Who can impress the forest? Bid, which means order. Order the tree, unfix his earthbound root. To fix means to make attached. Wu Ding. So unfix means to take out. Sweet bodements, good. Abodement is a prophecy. Uh, in English today, we use the verb to bode ill, shong zao, to bode good, uh, to bode well, ji zao. Rebellious dead, rise never till the wood of Burnham rise. And our high placed Macbeth himself shall live the lease of nature. Pay his breath to time and mortal custom. So he's saying that Macbeth will die of natural causes. He will not die early. Yet my heart throbs to know one thing. There's one more thing I want to know. Throb means beat, right? A beating heart. Tell me if your art can tell so much. Art here means skill or craft. So if you can, tell me, shall Banquo's issue ever reign in this kingdom? Will Banquo's children really become kings? And they say, the witches say, seek to know no more. Macbeth, I will be satisfied. You must tell me. I will be satisfied. Deny me this and an eternal curse fall on you. So if you don't tell me, I will curse you. 
let me know. But the cauldron descends, the whole thing disappears. And then this word. This is actually French. Uh, and we read it as oboe. An oboe. OK, in modern English, it's spelled like. Uh, the subtitles say oboe, O-B-O-E. This is. Uh, I think something like D Chang D or Zi D or something like that. It's a musical instrument. So we have music as the cauldron disappears. Why sinks that cauldron? So where is it going? And what noise is this? And the witches say, show, show, show. Show his eyes and grieve his heart. Make him sad. Grieve his heart. Come like shadows. So depart. So come shadows, show him what he wants to know. A show of eight kings and Banquo last. The eighth king with a glass in his hand. A glass is a mirror. Jingzi. So basically the witches answer him. Banquo and his children will become kings. In fact, it shows total of eight kings. So it's Banquo and then seven generations after him. So presumably the seventh generation would be King James. And then like Macbeth gets very angry that this will happen. Uh, and then it's uh, let's skip down here. And yet the eighth appears who bears a glass. There's a mirror which shows me many more. So on stage are only eight people, but in the mirror, Macbeth sees even more people. So like Banquo's entire line of children will be kings. And some I see that twofold balls and treble scepters carry. These are the signs of authority of the English king. Um, last year, or was it earlier this year, when Queen Elizabeth died and King Charles succeeded to the throne there was a whole coronation ceremony right did you guys watch the ceremony okay it was very long but in at one at several points in the ceremony the bishop like put a crown on his head put a scepter Trenzang, in his hand gave him like the the royal ball lots of stuff to put on the king uh, and each of them are a symbol of a kind of power that belongs to the king. So these are some of those symbols, two balls and three scepters. Horrible sight, something Macbeth does not want to see. Now I see it is true. Banquo's children will become kings. OK, let's stop here, finish the play before next week. <laughs>